So I'd like to welcome, first of all, uh, Helen, uh, who is going to be uh, giving our first uh, first session. Uh, Helen Conan is a physiotherapist from UBC. So over to you, Helen. We look forward to your talk. Thanks. Hello, thank you. Uh, let me just share my screen here. There we go. Okay, hi. Uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Helen and I'm a physical therapist at the UBC Physical Therapy and Research Clinic. So we are a clinic that is based on UBC Vancouver campus uh, and I'm here today to talk a little bit about just staying active at home during these unusual times. Um, but first I just want to get in and talk about our clinic on campus. So we offer services to people on campus and the greater Vancouver community um, and we are affiliated and part of the Department of Physical Therapy at UBC which is really wonderful for two different reasons. First off we have UBC students uh, as part of our clinic who do all the assessment and treatment under the supervision of the physiotherapist like myself and this brings a ton of energy to the clinic as we bring in the next generation of physical therapists. We also have the added benefit of being affiliated closely with all the researchers and having access to some cutting edge and novel um, changes in the physiotherapy profession that we can pass on to all of our clients. For those of you um, who are not familiar with physiotherapy, I'll just talk you through how an appointment typically runs. It starts with a conversation between you and your therapist, um, giving you an opportunity to tell your story and talk about what's bringing you in for the appointment. From there we go into what's called the objective exam so we'll ask you to bend and twist and move around and we'll look at all that if it's a hands-on appointment we might do a little bit of poking and prodding with our hands which will lead us to our physiotherapy diagnosis the diagnosis is really what we're coming up with to drive your individual treatment plan all of this can be done in person but also during these unusual times we can do it all through a computer screen just like we are today so there's lots of flexibility around there in addition to the physiotherapy appointments, we also offer group fitness classes. Um, we have different programs for people who've had neurological conditions or stroke, such as the FAME and GRASP programs. And we also offer GLAD, which is a program specifically designed for people who have osteoarthritis. So we're most interested in how to stay healthy and fit and moving uh, during these times when it's been harder than ever to get outside and perhaps do what we normally do. So without further ado, let's get into a little bit of that together. So I'm gonna lead you through a through few physical therapy exercises that are perhaps things that we would give you in an appointment. Um, first and foremost, safety is our number one consideration. We are interacting through a computer screen. I'm not there to catch you if something were to happen. So please, please, please only do what you are comfortable with. We don't want anybody accidentally ending up in some sort of trouble. I'll show two versions of every exercise. The first version of the exercise will be in sitting. I'll then show a standing version if people prefer. I encourage you to try whatever feels right for you. Please work within your comfort zone and within the limits of what you feel like is safe for you. Okay, so I'm just gonna change my camera angle. I'm gonna move a little bit farther back into the room so you guys can see me better and then let's get started. Okay, so the first exercise we're going to do is a little bit of marching on the spot. So we'll start by sitting up nice and tall, really think about taking a big breath into the whole trunk. Let that breath out. I think that's okay. Yeah. And then we're going to just bring our knees up towards our chest. One knee at a time, alternating back and forth. If you wish to try the standing version, come on up with me. If you prefer to stay seated, I encourage you to do so. You can hold on to the chair for balance and we can do the same exercise in standing. Just like this, working the muscles in the front of the hip. Let's do two more on each side. One more on each side. There we have it. All right, so that's exercise number one. We can do marching and sitting or standing. Exercise number two is leg kicks. We're just going to kick one leg forward and then the other. I'll show you from the side, working the muscles in the front of the legs, one leg forward and then the other. If you prefer to try a standing version, we can scooch ourselves forward on the chair. So our sit bones are up near the edge, across the arms over the chest, and we can use our muscles in our legs to drive ourselves up into standing. If you prefer to stay seated, we can just continue with the leg kicks. There we have it. Let's do two more sit to stands or two more leg kicks per side. Just like that, using the leg muscles, our big muscles in our legs to keep us moving. Excellent. Unless you want exercise for the upper body. 
throughout this, okay? So we'll start by taking one leg and just opening it up to the side to make some space in the hips. And then we're gonna squeeze the shoulder blade back come on back in. We'll open up the other leg, squeeze the shoulder blades back and come on back in. If you wish to try the standing version, feel free to come up, take a step to the side, squeeze the shoulder blades, come on back in, let's take a step the other way, squeeze the shoulder blades and come on back in. So one more each way, there we go. Things like this are really great to try to counteract all the sitting that we do on a day-to-day -day basis and get our bodies moving and active. So those are some different exercises that we can do at home as long as they're safe and feel comfortable for you. We can work the leg muscles, we can work the arm and shoulder muscles in lots of different ways. If you are interested in pursuing a little bit more home exercise programming, Christine's gonna distribute some information with some exercises after this session. And of course you can come into physiotherapy and we'll put something together that's specifically designed for what you need and what's best for you. We have lots of support for virtual care. So if you do wish to have an appointment from the comfort of your own home, we have um, our office assistant is very able to troubleshoot through how to get connected, just like Christine did at the start of the session today. So if anybody has any questions about any of these exercises or staying fit or healthy at home, I encourage you to ask away or to get in touch with us at the end of this presentation. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you enjoyed a little bit of a workout today. Awesome. Thank you, Helen. Um, are there any questions for Helen? We have a couple of uh, just time for one or two questions. And if you'd like to put your hand up or type a question in the chat box, we will um, be happy to unmute you. Oh, you're not. No, I'm just saying Helen, because I can't focus myself. Oh, I see. Uh, Mario. Uh, yes, um, the question is for people with dementia, they will not remember these procedures. Do you have a printed illustrated copy of this exercise so they can follow at home? Thank you. Great question. Uh, we don't have a printed of these specific exercises, but we do have printouts of other exercises that will be distributed at home that are very similar, very, very similar. I'd say about 80% the same. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, I see my question box is flashing here. Uh, yes, Bobby asks, are these exercises good for people who have been diagnosed with osteoporosis or hip replacement? Great question. So for people with osteoporosis, we do want to try to exercise in a load bearing way as much as possible. So if you feel comfortable with standing and again, safety is very important, we encourage you to do exercises like these in standing. If you have had your hip replaced, then the physiotherapist you'll see at the hospital after the hip replacement will give you some specific exercises. If you're waiting for a hip replacement, these are wonderful exercises as long as they feel okay from a pain standpoint. Okay, one more quick question. Uh, Yolanta, I'm gonna unmute you. Yolanta. Yeah, Yolanta, your off. mic is open. What? What did you say? Uh, did you have a question? Yeah, yes. I'm asking how many times a day we have to do this exercise. Excellent question. I like the excitement for exercises. So we encourage people to work out more frequently throughout the day. So to do them more often rather than pushing themselves really, really hard and only doing them once or twice. So I would say you could think about doing these like morning, noon and night, three times a day and just work to the point where you feel tired and then move on to the next exercise. Awesome, thank you, Helen. Um, that's all the time we've got for today. We are going to move along, but we really appreciate your joining us. And um, we're going to move on to our next presenter. So uh, Colleen Butcher will be joining us from Island Health in just a moment. We're just going to shift uh, slides here. Sure. So I'm Colleen Butcher. I'm a clinical nurse specialist in Island Health on Vancouver Island. I work in the seniors health portfolio. 
and I'm here today to talk to you about a online video series we have for caregivers who care for a loved one who has a diagnosis of dementia. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the videos and then I'm actually going to show you a video. Oh, there we go. So I just need to read my notes for a little bit. So this, this video series is available online for free from our Island Health website. It's also available in DVD and that there's a cost associated with the DVD. And I can give you the information to access this uh, later in the presentation. So the series aims to empower family caregivers with the information they need to tackle the daily challenges presented by dementia. So caring for a loved one with dementia disorder requires families to deal with unfamiliar and sometimes bewildering experiences. So here you can see a pamphlet that we have that's related to our award-winning Sharing the Journey video series. So it was developed by our multimedia uh, department in Island Health and had some funding from the Victoria Hospitals Foundation. On the right, you'll see where it says series content. This is all the different videos that you can view. You can view them in any order that you want to watch them in. Each one is from five to 10 minutes long. And um, the topics that you see here were, were decided on by caregivers themselves. So each video has a section where one or two care, actual caregivers are interviewed. There might be a healthcare provider who is interviewed. And then there's a scenario that's acted out by professional actors. And then uh, there's also a section on do's and don'ts. So we're going to watch one of the videos. I'm, I've chosen the, one of the shorter ones. It's on verbal and physical outbursts. So if we can just watch it, it's about four and a half minutes long. Verbal or physical outbursts can occur suddenly with no apparent reason or result from a frustrating situation. While aggression can be hard to cope with, it is important to understand that the person with dementia is not acting this way on purpose. No patience. None whatsoever now. He goes to tie a shoe and just tying that shoe and there's a big outburst. He now swears and I, I hear quite a few things and that's just from taking his coat off the hanger because it's not coming off fast enough for him or trying to choose his clothes in the morning. Um, he can't find anything. He doesn't know where it is. And so he's, he's getting more and more volatile with his voice. He's getting more volatile with his hands and not towards me, but he's slapping the wall. He's slapping the table, um, slapping whatever is in front of him. One of the main things that comes up where there seems to be some difficulty and some tension is where they're responding to stimulus in the environment and they may not have the same context as the person who is, you know, moving towards them or um, moving around in their environment. So the person might misinterpret what's happening and respond to their interpretation of the events that are happening. A person with moderate to severe dementia may be unable to recognize, meet or communicate their needs to their caregivers and may have difficulty understanding what behavior is socially acceptable. Holy smoke! No! No, I can't! Okay. Chelsea, what are you doing? Oh Lord, how many times have I told you? Find something to ask me. I'll help you. I'll find it for you. I can't! I can't! Don't! I can't! No! 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 You're always adjusting to different situations all the time, 24 hours a day. And you figure you've got one thing all figured out and it, it works. And then a day or two later, it doesn't work. So you have to figure out, well, how can I do this a different way? So you're always thinking about how can I make life easier for him? 
and then I go, how can I make life easier for me? I'm very short-fused at times. I, I'm not very pragmatic, so I had to learn patience, and patience was the biggest thing I had to learn right from get-go, because if you don't have any patience, you just end up arguing with one another, and that doesn't do any, anybody any good at all. So. Um, I used to take a deep breath, I used to go out into the garage sometimes and have a silent primeval roar out there and say, okay, get on with it, this is the way it is, and I'd say, Phew, okay, so I would come back in the house and we would start as though the conversation hadn't even begun. Chelsea, no. I'm sorry. There are two robins in the bird bath outside. Let's go have a look. Yes, come on. Come on. You like the birds? Yes. Yes, we'll have a look. Come on. No, I can't. Yes, you can. Yeah, we'll go and look at the bird. It is a learning experience. I have to have a lot of patience. I have to watch the way I phrase things. I have to watch the way I talk to him. Um, I've been told to keep an even tone, to not yell, to say I'm sorry quite often, and put all those three things together at once doesn't always work. <laughs> And nobody's perfect. I'm learning right along with him. So if you're interested in accessing these videos, here are the web sites. Um, I prefer to watch it on YouTube. They, they tend to be clearer on YouTube. And then you can see at the bottom uh, our media sales if you're interested in purchasing a DVD. Next slide. So in, in addition to providing the video series, we also have developed a facilitator's guide. So if you or your group wants to get together and have a look at these videos together, whether you're a healthcare provider or not, we provide some guide, a guide to how to facilitate that conversation. And so if you want a copy of that facilitator's guide or any of the other access to the videos or DVDs or whatever, this is my contact information below. And thank you. Okay, so thank you, Colleen. Um, we are going to share the links with the group as well. And um, we're a little bit behind, so I am going to move us along to the next speaker, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. And uh, now we're going to introduce Bobby Symes. Um, Bobby is from the United Way of the Lower Mainland. And so we're just going to get Bobby up. And there is Bobby. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to pass the uh, screen over to you, Bobby. Right. Here you go. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Um, I am Bobby Sines, and I am the Assistant Director of Population Health at the United Way. And uh, today I'm thrilled to be part of this uh, virtual um, event. Uh, it's very exciting in these different times and uh, really looking forward to seeing how it's all come together. The presentation so far has been really great. And I want to talk to you today a little bit about some of the healthy aging programs that fall under the banner of population health at the United Way. So when I say healthy aging, what does that mean? Um, the programs that we have uh, at the United Way all have these three things in common showing up on your screen. 
helping BC seniors stay at home and in their communities. What we do know is that the vast majority of individuals as they age want to stay at home and in their communities. So having programs to facilitate this um, is very important. Uh, second bullet point, we build on the strengths and talents and passions that already exist in neighborhoods. We also know that the true experts to help facilitate um, having or keeping or ensuring that older adults can remain in their homes and communities. Uh, the true experts are the neighborhood houses, the community centers, the nonprofits um, already running seniors programs. So we partner with these organizations, understanding that each community is very different and have their very own ways of doing things. And finally, we support older adults to have greater control over their independence, health and dignity. Um, we know that most individuals want to remain independent, so we want to provide them with the tools that they need to support that. And although we have several programs, um, I want to talk today about one in particular uh, now having um, and how having such a robust network of organizations provincially allowed us to very quickly respond to um, the COVID pandemic. So I'm gonna to talk to you briefly about Better at Home. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of the Better at Home program, but it is a provincially funded um, by the Ministry of Health. It's facilitated and led by the United Way and offered by community organizations throughout the province. This is a snapshot uh, that you can see from our 2018 and 19 um, program data. We're still collecting the 19-20 data, but you can see we had over, um, We've got almost 12,000 participants uh, in the Better at Home program. We delivered, um, you know, the services that you'll see on the right hand side of your screen are non-medical in nature that we provide. So things like house, light housekeeping, friendly visiting, transportation, grocery shopping, light yard work. Uh, of course, in some areas of our province, snow shoveling being very important. Um, and of course, 51% uh, of the services that are being offered our light housekeeping. Um, and you'll also notice just with some of the stats here that uh, an average participant in the Better at Home program is a female living uh, on her own between the ages of 75 and 84. So um, be, when COVID um, came into play, um, more and more people were encouraged to of course self-isolate, uh, seniors who were able to live independently with the help of family and friends were finding that those supports were now unavailable to them. So the province, uh, the Ministry of Health, in collaboration with uh, a resource, uh, information resource called 211, the Better at Home program, and United Ways across the province, um, we were able to very quickly mobilize uh, to assist seniors in the community with vital supports that they needed um, and that had been disrupted due to COVID-19. The Safe Senior Strong Communities program allowed volunteers to be connected with seniors in the region, um, help with things with grocery shopping, meal preparation, prescription pickup and drop off. Um, and then those friendly visits, um, those check-ins, just uh, to ensure that everything was okay and to have a person to talk to to make sure um, that you were getting those things that you needed. Uh, once seniors and volunteers um, contacted BC211, they were then matched with one of those uh, Better at Home programs that I was just describing uh, in a community that they lived um, and made a match between the volunteer uh, and the senior to ensure that they were getting those uh, the essentials that they needed. So basically the basket of services um, changed a little bit from your standard better at home where I talked about things like 51% uh, of the services that we typically offered in better at home were housekeeping uh, due to COVID-19 items like housekeeping, transportation weren't able to safely be provided um, due to no contact, social distancing, et cetera. But we were able to ensure that some of the basic necessities were met, things like phone and virtual check-ins, uh, grocery shopping and delivery. So we were encouraging, Dr. Bonnie Henry encouraged, you know, all seniors, please stay at home, um, allow other people to do these things for you. So we were able to align volunteers to go and pick up the groceries and safely de deliver them back to the seniors' homes. Um, same like uh, prepared meal delivery. 
uh, in many cases our neighborhood houses where seniors could typically come in and enjoy a meal um, as a part of a social time with friends weren't able to do that anymore but um, basic food security and nutrition remained of utmost important um, for all of our, our seniors and communities so we wanted to make sure they had access uh, to food and so our prepared meal delivery as well as the grocery shopping was taking place and of course, prescription pickup and drop offs. We were very quickly able to ensure that volunteers um, were able to pick up prescriptions uh, for older adults and have those prescriptions safely delivered to their homes. So I wanted to just show very quickly some stats because these were pretty staggering. Um, this program, so Senior Strong Communities, launched at the very end of March. So I believe our go to date was March 27th. And if we recall from a couple of slides ago, we, um, in a typical Better at Home program, we had about 12,000 participants. Well, in a short nine week period, we had over 10,000 seniors um, call in through BC211 or uh, um, went to a better local Better at Home program um, to ensure that these services were being offered. So close to, and I would say within the next couple of days, we're going to reach over 12,000 um, senior referrals to the Safe Senior Strong Communities Program. Um, and what's also really staggering and encouraging was we had over 8,000 volunteers um, say that they would like to assist seniors in the community. So this was just an attestment to the, the people out there and uh, willing to provide services. Uh, on top of that, this number here, is what I want to draw attention to. So almost 84,000 services uh, were provided in that five week period. So just a staggering number um, of things that happened. And you can sort of see from this table that the vast majority or half of them, um, almost 44,000 as of yesterday, were phone check-ins. And so this was just a volunteer calling a senior um, playing games, watching TV with them, uh, talking about a book, uh, that they had read, but, or just making sure that they were okay. Uh, grocery shopping and delivery, uh, we had did, performed over 10,000 um, grocery shops and deliveries, and same with the meal prep. So between local food hubs, community kitchens, um, or even just going to uh, Subway and picking up a sandwich, um, those things were all provided. And I want to add that although uh, the, like the services are provided for free, but of course, for the most part, um, seniors are still, you know, paying for the food um, and the groceries, and that the the program was just providing the service for free. Um, and then of course, some as things sort of picked up and leveled off, we were able to start tra providing some transportation, um, etc. So, and I just wanted to share this quote, um, and in case somebody can't see their screen, I'm just going to read it out very quickly because it was very heartwarming, and we received tons of this feedback from the program. It says, hi, Carrie, thank you very much to you and Tammy for arranging the latest shopping. Thank Crystal for being such a great miracle worker. I'm bedridden much of the time, and she's able to find foods and beverages you can keep beside my bed when I can't get up the stairs to the kitchen. She also makes sure that the items she manages to find Provide me with a good balanced diet. Your service means everything to me. I actually cried from relief and gratitude today. All the best to all of you. Uh, and you can see it, it warms my heart. You know, every time I read these things, because I really see the, the impact that the volunteers are having out there in the community. Uh, and that's uh, pretty much all I had to say. I really wanted to highlight um, this program and how quickly we were able to leverage the community senior services sector um, and how they really stepped up in this um, uh, a time that we haven't seen um, for you know over 100 years. And uh, I'm really encouraged to see the number of volunteers reaching out to help seniors in the community. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Bobby. Um, any questions from the audience? Can either put a hand. Oh, Mario. Uh, uh, very, on, just a, there you, you go. A uh, very quick question is about. Uh, uh, I live in Burnaby, and I know some seniors who are who 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 I think might need help in. I see that there's a mention about light a uh, light uh, yard work. So how do they contact uh, the uh, Burnaby uh, Better at Home program? 
so that they can discuss fees and whatever is necessary to make the sure. service available. Thank you. Absolutely. To keep things easy right now um, and to keep our messaging consistent, we're still saying call 211. So all they have to do is pick up the phone, call 211, and a 211 operator will uh, provide the necessary information that they get from them and in this particular situation that individual would get a referral to the um, to uh, an organization in Burnaby called Mosaic and Mosaic would help to arrange services but 211 that's just my big that's to keep it simple we're just saying to everybody just call 211 and the 211 operators are trained and provide the help awesome thanks Bobby um, Chi Hi, it's about a prescription uh, pickup and delivery. So uh, I live in Burnaby. How could I uh, be able to arrange this? Absolutely. So the message is the same. It's uh, phone 211, um, that 211 operator. You can just, they'll ask you some, some simple questions, your name, where you live the type of service that you're interested in, and then that data will then be dispersed to your local Better at Home. Again, in this case, because you're in Burnaby, depending on where in Burnaby, it would either be the Senior Services Society in New Westminster or Mosaic in Burnaby um, would be able to arrange to um, work with you to ensure that your prescriptions were picked up. Uh, as you know, you usually need to show ID when you pick up your prescription, but we've worked with the BC Pharmacists Association um, to ensure that volunteers um, you might have to call the, your local pharmacy and let them know that, you know, the name of the volunteer that will be picking uh, the prescription up. But your that local Better at Home program will guide you through this process every step of the way and help you with that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bobby, for joining us. And we will send out links if uh, anyone has more questions and needs more information. And at this point, we're going to pass it over to Avery from uh, Alzheimer's Society of BC. So thank you again, and we'll make a quick transition here. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Can everyone see me and hear me okay? Looks great. Awesome. Well, hi, I'm Avery. And um, I, as mentioned, I'm from the Alzheimer's Society of BC. So thank you so much for having me today. And thank you to all the previous presenters who have shared the important work you're doing. So the Alzheimer's Society of BC is a charitable organization who supports all British Columbians who are connected to dementia in some way. And so even though our in-person programming is suspended temporarily due to the pandemic, I wanted to share some of the supports we have that you might be interested in. And all the information I share with you will be sent to you after the presentation, including links that you can check out for more information. So the first thing that I wanted to mention is our first link dementia helpline. Um, we've extended the hours permanently as well for the English line to make it more accessible. So if you have any questions about Alzheimer's disease or other call our first link dementia helpline for information and support toll free. So the English line runs from Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. And then we also have service in Cantonese and Mandarin, as well as Punjabi, Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Also, I wanted to let you all know that we now have weekly webinars on a range of topics. So right now they're on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. generally. So yesterday, for example, we had a webinar about accessing services in the time of COVID, and we got some great feedback on that. So you'll be provided with a link to our webinars page and also our recorded webinars, so you can take a look um, and see what interests you. And I wanted to mention as well, our website has been updated with COVID-related information, so for people living with dementia, caregivers, and healthcare providers. So if you're looking for more information, you can find that on our website. We've also just released the spring editions of our quarterly newsletters. So Connections is for um, caregivers, healthcare providers, and the greater community. And then Insight is um, by, by and for people living with dementia. So actually I saw Mario on the call, who is our editor for Insight and a member of our leadership group. 
So he has a really great editorial here you can check out um, where he's sharing his story, uh, a great interaction with his neighbors in the time of COVID. So you'll get a link for um, that you can use to subscribe or check out our spring um, editions. And of course, I wanted to mention this Sunday is our IG Wealth Management Walk for Alzheimer's. So things are looking a bit different this year. It's our first online walk. Generally, we'd have walks all throughout BC in person, um, but due to physical distancing, we, we've gone online. But it's really exciting because it's Canada-wide, so we're all coming together. Um, and there'll be a live broadcast starting at 9 a.m. There'll be performers, fitness challenges, and participants from across Canada. I'd really encourage you to check it out. It's a fun activity. Um, you can see what we're all about, and it's really a great way to come together in this time. So you'll get a link for that as well if you'd like to participate. Now, of course, you might be wondering what this shiny thing behind me is. Um, this is our wheel. We bring it to different events in the community. So we've brought it to the PNE. Uh, I was at a Connects game where we brought this, and uh, we think of it as a way to test your dementia IQ. So each number here corresponds to a question. And uh, normally I'd let you spin the wheel. In this case, I'll spin it for you. I think we got some volunteers and uh, you can win some prizes. So we have a, a stress ball that looks like a brain. I've been using it a lot at my desk. Uh, we have pens and then we also have our pins, our forget-me-not pins that we wear in January for awareness month um, or at different events like me today. So, um, Christine, do we have a volunteer for the first question? Uh, I believe we had Juliet and John as our first uh, volunteers. So I'm just going to unmute them. So Juliet or John, if you'd like to unmute and uh, you'll get the first question. Okay. We're Ready waiting to go? with bated breath. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll spin it for you. Here we go. See what question we get. It is, oh, almost question nine, but it's question eight. So let's test your knowledge, shall we? Yeah, All right. Yeah. Question eight. Oh, this is a good one. True or false? If someone in my family has had dementia, I am likely to get it too. False. False. Yes, you're correct. So there's a certain form of dementia called familial Alzheimer's disease with a genetic link, but it's quite rare. It's about 5% of all dementia cases. So most cases are not genetic. So you got that correct. And uh, Christine will connect with you so that I can get you a prize. So good job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, Joyce, I believe you volunteered as well. Sure, here we go. I gave it a good spin. Oh, and we appear to have just lost Joyce. So, uh, else do we have this question? Do we have another volunteer? Um, oh, there she is. Joyce, let's try again. You're self-muted. Okay, Joyce. Okay, we're having some sound problems there. Um, oh, I, I, I finally got it. Okay. Oh, perfect. Hi, Joyce. Hi. Okay, I will give you your question. It's another true or false. So this one is true or false. The majority of people living with dementia are living in care homes. False. Correct, you guys are great. Yes, yeah, so it's false. Um, approximately 60% of people living with dementia live by themselves or with a caregiver in our communities. So it just highlights that we can all play a role in making our communities more dementia friendly. So great job. You guys are on point today. <laughs> Do we have time for one more or should we end we, it there? Um, I think we have time for one more. I see Yolanta's hands up. Yolanta, I'm going to unmute you. And then if you, there you are. Yolanta, are you ready for us to spin? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. Perfect. Okay, here we go. 
I gave it another good spin. Okay, question eight. Oh, I think we had that one already. Yeah, but yes. We'll move it along to question nine. <laughs> that way we can mix it up a little bit more. Okay, perfect. Another true or false. Dementia and Alzheimer's disease are two different terms for the same thing. Mm, uh, apparently, no. There is some difference between them, but yeah. Yes, you're correct. It's uh, it's false. So we think of dementia as kind of the umbrella term um, for a variety of, of brain changes um, that affect your memory, thinking, and reasoning. Um, but uh, Alzheimer's disease is one type of dementia, along with vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, different types of dementia under that larger umbrella. So you got it right too. You guys are all great. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. So I will connect with uh, the three winners and we will get those prizes along. And thank you so much to Avery for setting this up for us. And of course, to the Alzheimer's Society for partnering with us and all of our exhibitors for mm -hmm. joining. We will have different exhibitors joining us in sec uh, session two. So we'll keep you posted on that. Mm -hmm.